Helium-3 is also stable, um, but it's not found commonly. Fortunately, it's lightweight, so it, it leaves. It literally leaves the atmosphere and goes into space. Um, so we don't have a lot of it here on Earth. Uh, and so you have to make it, or you have to go into space. And there's a whole other thing about how do, where do you get it? Do you get it from the moon? Jupiter has, it turns out, massive amounts of helium-3. And so, but when you take deuterium and helium-3 and you fuse those together, you also get that helium particle, that alpha particle that we call that infusion. But instead of the neutron, you get a proton. And that proton is a charged particle. It's a helium, a hydrogen nucleus. That proton is now trapped in the magnetic field pushes back and you can extract that electricity. Now there's some prices to be paid for this helium-3 fuel, but for a high beta system like uh, a pulsed magnetic fusion system, that's really the ideal fuel. When you say prices, uh, where, what is the, yeah, is there like technical costs or what, what, what are the prices? What shape do the prices take? <laughs> All kinds of shapes, um, a physics, an engineering, a technical, and a business cost. Okay. Um, and so let's let's dive in. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, great. So, yeah, so we talked about how helium-3 is, so from the fusion physics point of view, we talked about 100 million degrees. That's the temperature that deuterium and tritium fusion works really well. And that's the temperature that traditional fusion folks have really focused on getting to. That's the threshold of when you get to 100 million degrees, you're at the operating point of fusion and you know it works, um, colloquially anyway. Um, helium-3 requires higher temperatures. That's not enough. Yes, fusion happens for helium, deuterium and helium-3 at 100 million degrees, but it's not its optimal temperature. And in fact, in a high beta system, the optimal temperature is higher 200, even sometimes 300 million degrees. So you have to get to even higher temperatures. Temperature's hard. And so you have to push to even higher temperatures than you had before. And so that's, that's one of the downsides. Um, the other downside can be as you get to those higher temperatures, we talked about B squared is NT. B squared is density times temperature. Well, for a given magnetic field, density and temperature are now inverse. So as I increase temperature, density decreases. And so now you have a, an issue of you may have less particles to do fusion, which means your fusion system has to get bigger than it was before. Mm -hmm. So for the same reaction rates, a helium-3 system compared to deuterium tritium has to operate at a higher temperature and be bigger. However, the flip side is, is if you can now recover energy at 80, at three times the energy efficiency, 30 at 80 some percent versus 30 some percent and recover all your input energy, then now it's actually about the same size mm -hmm. because for the same electricity output, not energy, it's not energy that we're worried about. It's electricity we're worried about electricity output, now you can actually build systems of similar size and similar energy, only they're now at this much higher efficiency. Got it. What Can you say more about size? What are we talking about here? Like what? Why is size a, an important constraint? And that gets to one of the other price that gets to money. So yeah. our goal is we want to build clean, low cost electricity and get it out in the world. But that means it needs to be low cost. Mm -hmm. That's fundamental. If it's really expensive, no one's going to buy it. And uh, while it can be clean, it's not going to be deployed. And so that is always has to be a part and uh, of why, what the promise of fusion is that can be low cost. Um, so how do we know how much fusion systems cost? It's a really great question. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to fundamental size that you have to just build things. And so there's some really first principles, cost engineering you can do around power plants for fundamentally, what do they cost? How much concrete went into it? Fundamentally, how big is it? Um, and that and that if you're doing a good job of manufacturing, the you are your goal is to manufacture a product for as low of cost as you can. So you can sell it for as for as low price as you can. It asymptotes to the material cost because you can never get cheaper uh, than that. So it's literally, in some sense, some sort of first principle sense is how much concrete how, it how, goes into, into building the power plant. How much concrete? How much concrete? How much steel? How much um, copper and aluminum? Different materials cost different amount, but at the end of the day, the cheapest function is the least amount of materials. Wow. Okay. And, and so that's, we think a lot about that and how we can make these systems smaller so they can be developed at lower cost. Now, there's a flip side. 
you still need to produce electricity. Mm -hmm. So if you make them really small and they don't produce electricity, and there is some minimum size to fusion, and that's really important. Fusion scientists and engineers don't see you'd ever have a uh, fusion generator on the back of your DeLorean, for instance. The physics doesn't let that one happen. At least physics is as we've understood for the last uh, you know, 100 or 200 years. 